All right, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Creditor Podcast. I'm your host, Chase Palmieri, and with me today is Patrick Lee. Patrick has founded multiple companies, but is probably best known as the co-founder and former CEO of Rotten Tomatoes, which is my all-time favorite movie rating site and has probably saved me years of my life uh, in avoiding bad films so far. So Patrick, thanks for coming on today. Thanks uh, for having me, Chase. Yeah, I, I wanted to start with how we met. Um, if I remember correctly, it was about three years ago, and me and my co-founders were working in a apartment in Petaluma, kind of working ourselves to the bone, trying to get out an early version of what we were at the time referring to as a Rotten Tomatoes for news. And I actually cold emailed you, and you were gracious enough to meet me for an hour at a in a hotel lobby in San Francisco, and you know, you really listen to what we had to say. Um, I'm just curious, is that something that you do often, fielding cold emails? Is, is it the Rotten Tomatoes angle that piqued your interest, or did I just catch you on a good day? Um, I, I'm generally try to be fairly accessible if I can. Uh, these days, everything's virtual, so it's, it's even easier. And I think because now there's like no commute time, maybe it might be a half hour call or something. Um, definitely the Rotten Tomatoes angle helped a lot. Uh, but, you know, if I'm out speaking at a conference or, or something like that, um, usually there'll be people who will follow up who want to talk more or learn more. Um, so, yeah, I think it's something I do pretty regularly. Okay. And full disclosure, after that meeting, Patrick actually became one of our first official advisors and ended up opening all of the doors that we've had opened, um, leading to our first round of investment and pretty much changing my life forever. So just a quick pause to thank you, Patrick, for changing me and my co-founders' lives. Um, but I'd like to get into the Rotten Tomatoes story. I know you've told this a million times on a bunch of other podcasts, so we'll try to keep this part brief, but it's important background for listeners for what I want to dive into next. Can you give the, the background on how Rotten Tomatoes went from being someone, a friend of yours, side project to becoming your team's main focus? Yeah, sure. So when we first started, we actually had a design firm. Uh, myself and Steven were co-founders of a design, design firm called Design Reactor. And we were doing web design for the entertainment industry. So we were doing stuff for a lot of stuff for Disney Channel. We were working with Warner Brothers, ABC, Artisan Entertainment, MTV, VH1. We made the online flash game for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And Sen, who created Rotten Tomatoes, was one of our creative directors. He was a big movie buff. And he came up with the idea on the side. Like, he was a huge Jackie Chan fan. And Jackie Chan had a movie, Rush Hour, coming out. And Sen wanted to know what all the critics were saying about Rush Hour. So he started just gathering all that information. And back then, most of the reviews weren't online. So he actually went to the library, looked up you know, magazines and newspapers to go and write down like quotes. Then he went back and his idea was, in terms of like visually, was to copy what the full page ads you would find for movies in the newspapers at the time. They would look like a poster with a bunch of quotes all over the poster. Um, but the only thing is in those ads, obviously those quotes were always good. And if the movie was good, those quotes would be from real critics. If the movie wasn't so good, it would include a lot of quotes from not real critics, like you know, radio station DJs or folks like that. And so his idea was, what if I include the quotes only from professional critics, but also include bad quotes, so good and bad for the movie, and then have a percentage um, of a score for the percentage of the critics that recommended seeing the movie. And so that was the idea. From the time he thought of the idea to launching it was only two weeks. And what was interesting was he wasn't even a coder. He was our creative director. So he could definitely design, um, but he wasn't a coder, so he built it in static HTML. And just flat static you know, HTML pages. And he, um, the thing he did that was really smart was he just focused on the movies coming out that week, the wide release movies. So the movies that the whole, that would come out at, for the whole nation at once. Um, and those happened to be the ones that people cared about the most. 
right? If they're, if they're thinking about watching a movie, the movies coming out that week, the new ones are the ones that people are really looking for. And, you know, he, every week he would add in the movies coming out that week. And so after about a month, you know, he probably covered 90% of what anyone would care about, you know, um, when they're thinking about watching a movie in the theaters, right? Because he would have like a whole month's worth of wide release movies. Um, and so the site was immediately useful. And the thing that got Steve and I more interested, we were hosting it for him. And so we could see the traffic growing. Um, it was, you know, slow, but steady, very steady. Um, and very soon after he launched it, it was starting to get noticed by like Yahoo Netscape being highlighted as like a cool site of the day or week or month. Um, and then also Roger Ebert wrote an article where he highlighted his favorite movie site, websites within the first year of launch and Rotten Tomatoes is one of them. And then also when Pixar released A Bug's Life, uh, we saw a spike in traffic and it turned out that that spike in traffic was actually coming from Pixar, meaning like a bunch of employees at Pixar were like getting on our site and constantly refreshing to see as we're adding more like um, reviews, what the critics were saying about their movie. Uh, and so those three things were probably the big things that where we're like, oh, maybe there's something here. And so, you know, we met up with Sen, we're like, hey, maybe we, we can do something more with this. And we basically decided for the three of us to kind of come in and focus all the resources on Ron Tomatoes. And then we actually gave our design from off to another group to take over. And I went out and raised a million uh, for us to actually run Rotten Tomatoes as a real company. So that's kind of how it started. Yeah, and in the early days, like you said, you were you were going and aggregating these reviews from magazines. I thought you were also aggregating from maybe individual blog sites from the critics, but it was purely from magazines and written print at the time? Um, I think it was mostly. I, if, if something was online, Sen would obviously grab that and link to it. Um, and then some stuff was not online and it would just include like a quote, but it wouldn't necessarily link anywhere. Um, but then, you know, very quickly, uh, more and more sources were coming online. And uh, it got to a point where when we first started running it as a company, we had 10 folks who were acting as editors because we were trying to cover more movies. We we're trying to go further out, like movies coming out, um, and then even and starting to like, cover movies on coming out on DVD, et cetera. Um, and then in order to scale more, we started working with another group called uh, MRQE, the Movie Review Query Engine, to start uh, building parsers to grab the reviews and bring it to, to us so that our guys wouldn't have to go out to look for the reviews. Um, and then uh, Steven built a content management system um, to grab all those reviews and make it a lot easier for our guys to come in to look at it and be like, you know, is the fresher rotten and what quote should we use? And almost everything else was already kind of done. Um, so it made it even faster. Uh, and eventually we even built a critic submission tool. So the critics themselves could come in and do everything, um, which obviously saved us a lot more time and also made us more accurate. So doing all those things allowed us to go from 10 editors down to just two. And those two could cover a lot more um, than we could when we had 10, doing everything manually. Yeah, and in those early days when it was a manual process, how many movies were you able to add you know, per week? Um, I mean, we were mainly focusing on the ones coming out that week. Uh, and then later on, those coming out plus like DVDs. Uh, and that was about it. Um, so, I mean, it was like 10, you know, five to 10 movies a week, something like that. Right, and so, at that time, even when you opened it up for critic submissions, it was really just one Rotten Tomatoes score, but now it's two scores where you have the critic score and the, the audience score. When did you open it up for audiences to start reviewing? Uh, gosh, that was probably like three years in or so. It was once we built the critic submission tool, um, we later repurposed it to allow users to do it as well. And I think, it was around the time MySpace started getting popular. And so we were like, and social networks started to become a thing. This is like post Friendster. Um, so I remember we actually made something we called the Vine. That was our version of a social network. Um, the idea being that if every user was a tomato, the Vine is the thing that connected them together. 
and where people could come on, like connect to each other and write their own reviews. Um, and so then they would have, at the time it was, you could have a, actually it was almost like four ones. You could have the cream of the crop, which were like the very famous film critics. Then there was the, the general tomato meter, which was all the critics. Then we had one for just users. And then I think we even had a score that was just your friends, which was kind of a lot of things. Um, and so that, we had all of those things, but then the one you see now is actually, I think the user score comes from Flixster. So the user score is Flixster. That's why it um, looks like a popcorn thing because that's actually their logo. Uh, and then the critic score com comes from Rotten Tomatoes. Right, and for listeners, Flixster was the company that acquired Rotten Tomatoes, which I definitely want to get into later, but I want to stay on this point. So when you opened it up to the public to review articles, was that because users were writing to you saying, hey, I would review too, or was it just that you saw an opportunity to have more on-site engagement? What was kind of the thinking to open that up just because the feature was there and you figured we might as well experiment with it and it worked? Well, for us, we had, before we added um, user reviews, we had message boards and our message boards were super active. I wanna say we were the biggest or one of the biggest um, most active message boards around movies. Uh, at the time. And even so, only about 1% of our users were actually registered on our site. Those are the really hardcore users. And they're primarily registering to be able to write into the, the forums. Um, so our idea about launching kind of our version of a social network and, at, and primarily to be able to write user reviews was to see could we get um, a higher percentage of those users to register and also could we make it more viral where they would start inviting their friends and everything. So that was kind of our, our reasoning behind, behind that. Okay, and you kind of just said it right there that about 1% of the user base was actually creating an account. Um, I think this is worth calling out because review platforms in general are kind of this weird type of service where the 99% can come and check ratings and get a lot of the value without ever even leaving an email or signing up or engaging with the review process themselves. How did you kind of frame that to investors who were looking at your site and saying, okay, how many active users or what's the engagement? How did you kind of reframe the story to highlight that, no, there's something valuable here. A lot of people are coming and visiting it, but that doesn't necessarily mean everybody's signing up and leaving reviews themselves. Well, we were in a weird situation because when we had raised our money, um, this was in January, 2000, the market, the bubble burst in, March of 2000. And then, you know, 18 months after that was 9-11. So it was like super weird time. People weren't raising money at that point. They were just trying to not die. Yeah. Um, so it, we didn't really have many investor conversations around this, but I would say this is also around the time where user generated content be, started becoming a thing. Like web 1.0 was just people wrote their own content. It was all like, you know, um, like slate and, you know, those kinds of, um, publications, online publications. They were just like, let's bring our newspaper and, and put it online and let, or let's make a site and we write articles or salon. I think it was like salon.com, those kind of companies, right? We were a little, almost like a halfway point. One, I would almost call us like 1.5 where we were an aggregator. We were like, okay, well, we don't see the value of us writing our own review, but, but we can aggregate reviews and, and kind of bring it all into one place. And then I think like 2.0, was um, when user generated content became much more of a thing. And when you look at a lot of sites that rely on user generated content, um, you know, it's a fraction of the people, uh, I think in some cases even less than a percent that are actually creating the content like Wikipedia. It's like tens of thousands of, of editors, you know, not a lot of people. Um, IMDB, how many people are actually going in and changing things? Um, YouTube videos like, how many are watching versus how many are actually uploading uh, Reddit, like tons of lurkers there. I think it's pretty normal for a, a small fraction to be the creators and, and a large fraction to be the, the viewers or the lurkers or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Okay, cool. And who came up with the, either the name, but also the rating icons, the original ones, this concept of using a tomato and a rotten tomato. Because the reason I ask is because I, 
feel like it might have ultimately been a competitive advantage for Rotten Tomatoes because it's kind of a silly brand uh, in a way, which means that you're not taking yourself as seriously, which hopefully means that audiences actually trust you more. Um, and maybe it differentiated you from other players in the space. Who came up with that? And do you think that the branding ultimately helped? Yeah, so Sen, you know, he came up with the idea, he came up with the name and all the, the branding. Um, the idea was basically, I don't know, during like Shakespeare times or something, you know, if, if performers were on stage doing a, a show and they were terrible, people would throw rotten fruits and vegetables at them. So that's how he came up with the idea. And that's why the rotten looks like a splat because it's like as if someone threw a rotten tomato and it hit a wall and it made a splat. Um, and I remember when we first started talking to studios or other folks about advertising, you know, when they heard the name, they would just be laughing because it was kind of a weird, silly name. Um, and, but the thing is, it's memorable. You know, when you hear it, you, you don't easily forget it. Um, and I think, yeah, when you look at like, I don't know, movies.com, I mean, I don't know if anyone even uses that now. I mean, that's a great name for movies, but it, it's very generic. Um, I think Rotten Tomatoes stands out because it is not something that people normally would have associated with movies. Um, so it stands out. People don't forget it easily. I think the only thing is potentially people might have trouble spelling tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I personally have a weird sense of loyalty to Rotten Tomatoes well before I met you. Um, and I do think it has to do with the brand. I, I, there's something more personable about it. And I think that looking back, um, I'm just very glad that you guys didn't change it once things started taking off and you didn't just get serious and go with the a simple five-star gold kind of rating icons. So I hope that that helped. Um, I, I wanna talk now back about Fl uh, Flickster who uh, eventually acquired Rotten Tomatoes while you were CEO. Um, let's start by letting me know how that deal came together. Were you, were you letting others know that you were looking to sell or did they come to you with an offer? So actually for us, uh, Flickster wasn't the one that acquired us. They acquired us later, but we weren't there anymore. Um, it's actually changed hands like six times, something like that. We sold to IGN Entertainment, which is a gaming company. IGN, then they rolled up a bunch of different companies um, and so it sold to Fox. Uh, so Fox owned IGN and um, as well as MySpace, I think at the time. Then Fox eventually said, we want to get out of this you know, they, they sold out um, MySpace and then they sold us over to Flickster. So Flickster bought it from Fox. Then Flickster with Rotten Tomatoes sold to Warner Brothers. And then fairly recently, Warner Brothers sold it, Flickster with Rotten Tomatoes over to Fandango. So Fandango owns it now. So it's changed hands like many, many times, including under two studios, Fox and Warner Brothers, and now under a ticketing site, Fandango. And I think it makes a lot of sense uh, under Fandango. Um, but as far as IGN is concerned, you know, we had folks coming to us when we were doing Rotten Tomatoes, like, um, that were interested in acquiring us, but the early offers were, you know, pennies on the dollar because of the crash. Um, and we didn't want to sell for anything less than like what our investors, you know, our last post money uh, valuation was because we didn't want our investors to lose money. So, we were basically like, we're not going to sell for pennies on a dollar. We'll sell for like a dollar on a dollar. Um, and looking back, you know, I think our bar was way too low. But at that time, it felt like, you know, 90 something percent of all startups, tech startups were going out of business. I mean, it felt like everyone was going out of business. So just even living and getting offers was already a good sign. Um, as far as IGN was concerned, I think they approached us maybe a year earlier and we're like, no, we're not interested. They came back again um, with a better offer. Uh, and at that time we were more like, yeah, maybe that might be something that's interesting. So we started talking to them more. Um, we started talking with a couple other companies who were interested as well. IGN improved the offer one more time and we're like, yeah, I think we'll go for it. Our investors were, were, were fine with it. They, they made some money. Um, and our thought was, you know, we can sell it. Um, and then, and then move on and try and do other, other things because at the time, you know, most of us had spent about five years on it. Um, 
we were still quite young and we thought, hey, let's, let's go and we can try other projects. Um, so that was kind of our thinking behind it all. Yeah, so uh, the dot-com crash and all these other companies around you are disappearing, running out of business, probably st struggling to find more investment. Um, I understand that that was kind of the macro environment, but inside of Rotten Tomatoes, was there ever a worry about running out of runway or going out of business? Or was it just the macro environment that kind of pushed your hand? No, I mean, there was definitely a worry. When we had our design firm, we had something like 25 people on staff. Uh, when we decided to do Rotten Tomatoes, we brought it run over. Um, and we had only raised a million. But then the market crashed. And we knew right away with our burn rate, we would be out of business within the year. So uh, especially once we gave our design from off to another group um, to take over, we lost that revenue. So we basically had to cut from 25 down to seven over the course of a year. Like I think it was like 25 to 17 to uh, 25 to 21 to 17 to 11 to seven, like roughly in kind of these batches we told everyone what happened. We accelerated investing for people that were going. Um, we said to start looking. And basically, we employed, tried to employ people until they found something um, so that they wouldn't have a gap, especially in such a hard time. But we, there was no way we could survive at that headcount. And even at seven, uh, everyone took at least a 30% pay cut. Myself and our marketing person, Paul, went to zero. Um, and so even our seven was probably the equivalent cost equivalent of like three or four, right? Um, and that allowed us, during that year or two, we were slowly increasing our revenue. Um, so we got, I think within about two years or so, got to break even. And so at that point you have an infinite runway. But yeah, it was definitely a concern, huge concern. Um, but in some ways I think it was good because it forced us to focus um, which is something that I didn't realize the value of, you know, all the startups I did after Rotten Tomatoes, I wasn't focused at all. Um, and because of market conditions, we were forced to be focused because we had extremely limited resources, but it was the focusing that made Rotten Tomatoes so good. Right. And do you kind of wish though, you were forced into this position of having to focus and, and triple down on what was already working, but was there a bigger vision for Rotten Tomatoes that, you know, now might not be reached, but was there something else that you could have done with Rotten Tomatoes, some other direction that you were long-term thinking you might take it in? Um, I think for us, uh, the only feature that I really wanted, um, but more just like I thought it would be a cool feature, not that it would make it a big company, was the idea of critics matching, was the idea that if you could come in and start putting your own reviews in, we could start tracking that against all the reviews that everyone else, including critics, were putting in, and we could start finding people who are similar to you. And that cohort of people who are similar to you would be a better predictor um, of whether or not you're gonna like a movie than all critics or all users or all friends. Um, and basically like a customized score for each person. So the score, the same movie, that horror movie, and you love horror movies, let's say, and I hate them, that horror movie might show up as 90% for you and it might show up as 10% for me, you know, something like that. Um, but, you know, looking back, you know, 2020, right? Like there are a lot of ways I think we could have gone had we thought bigger. Um, I think what happened was we basically, if you use a poker analogy, we ended up having a pretty good hand, I don't know, pocket jacks or something or better. And, and we just played it very conservatively and, and kind of didn't cash out well when I think we should have been aggressive, you know, once the market started improving, raising more money and, and, and really trying to get much bigger. Um, and there's a lot of ways I think you, we could have gone because we're at the point where people are deciding what to see. And that's like a really powerful position to be in and we were generating revenue primarily through advertising, but it's weird because most of that advertising revenue is coming from studios, but it was a love hate relationship because they would buy the ads with us before the movie came out. None of us would have any idea if the movie was going to be good or not. And if it was good, they'd love us. They'd probably buy more ads with us, but if it came out rotten, which it often did, they would hate us. They would be 
threatening us about pulling that ad campaigns and everything. And we're like, we can't change the score. If we change the score, like no one will ever trust us again. But what we should have been doing is really focusing more on the user um, and trying to monetize the user more because uh, 100% of the time we're benefiting the users. And I would say we're actually benefiting them more when a movie's rotten because they can avoid it if, if they want to. Um, and so, you know, looking at the business models, uh, Fandango owns us now, they're movie ticketing. Um, a big part of buying a ticket is figuring out what to see, right? I mean, they're probably hurting a lot now, but you know, they are multiple times larger than a Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and you look at Netflix. At the time, Netflix was still shipping out, you know, DVDs, uh, which we were like, we thought about it, but we're like, nah, we don't want to deal with shipping out DVDs. What we didn't think about was, oh, what happens when it all goes digital? You know, we didn't think that far ahead. In that situation where you wouldn't have to go out and ship out DVDs and have tons of people in warehouses doing that, like if it was just digital, that could have made a lot more sense for us. Again, had we been more forward thinking to raise a bunch of money to go that direction, right? Um, because like, if you think about it, Netflix, basically they ship DVDs, they put Blockbuster out of business, but then the thing that probably would have defeated a Netflix, they just did themselves by switching from DVDs to streaming, you know, kind of like Amazon, um, where they became an online bookstore, putting out Barnes and Noble. And then they also kind of disrupted themselves by creating Kindle and going digital. Right. Um, so normally, that potentially could have been an opportunity for someone else to come in to do, but they were smart enough and spent enough around R and D and thinking forward, you know, in the future to be able to do that. So um, I think those are like directions we could have gone um, had we been more forward thinking, but, but we weren't. Yeah, I guess we'll never know, but that I would imagine that that would be a great user experience. Go check out a movie rating, decide that you want to watch it. And then right below it, there's a button that says, you know, start, start watching. Yeah. Um, I mean, now, even now, a lot of times you go to almost anywhere, they're going to have a rating when you're thinking about um, purchasing the movie to watch or renting the movie to watch online. Yeah. Um, when Fox ended up with, with Rotten Tomatoes as part of its portfolio and then later Warner Bros. Uh, like you said, it's been passed around a bit before ending up at Fandango. Were you or your other co-founders concerned that it was in the hands of a movie studio that might try to manipulate the ratings and therefore kind of destroy all the built-in trust? Um, I mean, it was a concern, but you know, I wasn't there for either of those, at either of those times, but you know, we still had some of some folks were there early um, that were able to kind of make sure around that. Um, and I think the studios themselves re would realize like it's pretty obvious if they're if they're cheating, you know, because every review's there, you can see every from every critic. And if that studio's movies are doing anything weird, like it would show up, like people would find it um, with all those hardcore users and. and millions of users using it. Uh, so, and if, if they were found to be cheating, it would destroy the property. So it hasn't happened. I mean, the one thing I would say that was, that people were quite suspicious of that I think looked very bad from the outside was when, um, I think it was Warner Brothers, they uh, launched a show briefly on, I think it was Facebook, where they were going to reveal the score for a movie. And because of that, they held off on having a tomato meter score for these movies until basically like, I think it was like the day of before the movie came out. And when normally it would be out like, you know, weeks in advance. Um, and uh, one of those movies I think was, I think it was either Batman versus Superman or Justice League. One of those, like a Warner Brothers movie and, and, Everyone was like, it's going to be rotten. You're holding it back because you're, you know it's not going to be good. And you don't want that people to see that score early. Um, whether or not that's true, I don't know. Like, uh, I don't think it, they, were, they meant it to, to be like that. But, you know, studios in the past, um, one way they would kind of cheat the users was they wouldn't allow the critics to screen a movie early. They'd force them to review it when the movie actually came out. Um, and basically any studio that did it 
it's like a 99% chance that movie is going to be very bad, you know, usually in the 30% range on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, and that's like when they acknowledge like this movie is not good and we can't have the critics going out there and bad mouthing it before it comes out. So we'll just let them do it. You know, once it's out, then it's out. Um, and so, no, we didn't have any issues. Even in that one, though, people were very suspicious. I had people writing to me about it. I even tried writing into Rotten Tomatoes to like let them know, like, hey, this isn't a good look. And uh, I think they stopped the show. They stopped doing that. Um, and I believe even someone at Rotten Tomatoes who was involved with some of that, uh, I believe he left as well. So, yeah, that was probably the closest to anything. And even that one, I don't know for sure um, what was going on there. Yeah. Um, let me let me try an exercise with you. I want to pretend for a second, put on your still CEO at Rotten Tomatoes hat, and I'm one of your employees, and I'm going to pitch you an idea, okay? I want to, I want to hear how you would think through this. Um, hey, Patrick, uh, we're doing great with ratings for movies and TV shows. Um, this is, especially with the streaming wars blowing up, we're getting a ton of traffic as people are sitting home during the pandemic and, and checking out ratings, a lot of traffic. But we, why don't we try doing ratings for podcasts or long form YouTube videos? What about these other types of longer form videos or audio types of content? Why don't we try doing ratings for those as well? Um, there are a number of folks doing, uh, ratings for podcasts. I, I personally have had at least three different company startups reach out to me, uh, you know, similar to when, how you reached out. Um, and I, you know, did calls with them to kind of talk through this issue. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea. Anytime, anything that requires like choice and picking, um, of any type of content or anything that you would consume, reviews will help with decision making, right? Whether it's like buying some clothes or a product on Amazon, you know, movies, games, music, books, podcasts, like restaurants, all of that. Yeah, hopefully yeah, news. Exactly, <laughs> news. All of that, whenever there's like too much choice, it helps to narrow. So that's always good. Um, I think with podcasts, one thing, one thing that was really good about movies, uh, and I would say TV shows to some extent, but really movies is like really, really good is at least before all the streamers and stuff all came in and, and people stopped going to theaters was there's only so many movies coming out each week, right? Even if you include all the indie films and all that stuff, the limited release stuff, it still isn't like a ton, maybe, I don't know, 20, 20 to 50. If you count just wide release, it's like, I think it's like three to five, something in that range. It's like really, really small amount. And almost all the people are focused, on, especially on those three to five, right? And we're not in tomatoes. We had 70% of our traffic coming and looking at movies that were basically in the theaters um, or maybe coming out in the next six to 12 months. Oh, majority of traffic is going there. Even of that traffic, majority is like the wide release movies, you know, or the movies coming out, wide release movies coming out that week, right? So it's like, because there's so few movies, uh, especially when you look at wide release movies, that all these critics out there, another thing is there's professional critics. Not everything has professional critics, right? Um, movies do. And because there's so few movies, those professional critics could basically see every movie or every wide release movie. Um, and so then you could have, compare apples to apples because you have these professional critics and they review the same things. So then you can actually have a score that's useful. With most other things, there's just too much, right? Um, where like mu music, there's too many, too much music. Games, there's game, big titles maybe you might be able to pull off, but like books, just too many books. Um, podcasts, et cetera, right? Restaurants. So it just makes it tougher. And then in those cases, user reviews work a lot better. Mm -hmm. um, critics reviews don't really work. Uh, so I would say podcasts, audio, YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, there's so many YouTube videos. I think, yeah, user reviews totally could work for something like, or user 
ratings can kind of help with that. But I, I think it would be difficult for either of those to really have the same structure as Rotten Tomatoes, um, just because you're talking about just so, so many of, of each of those. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea, but I would say if I was running Rotten Tomatoes, I would really be thinking much more about like, um, I think I would really still continue to focus more on the movie space. And I would be looking more at in the Fandango, Netflix, IMDb, um, or, or like Real Good is another one that recently that I thought was, was quite interesting where they, for every, every kind of movie or TV show you can think of, they will tell you where you can see it or where you can buy it or rent it um, and, and make your own like consolidated queue across all services. And that's something I, I was like, oh yeah, I, I totally wish Rotten Tomatoes had done. Um, so I, I think I would really think more about how do you expand within the category versus expanding into additional categories. Um, because I just think movies work really well from this idea of, uh, of like reviews. Yeah, and that gets back to your focus concept, which um, for listeners, you have a few different talks um, and videos out there about this concept of focus for entrepreneurs and founders. Is there any kind of brief bullet point that you can give about the importance of focus or what that means to you? Yeah, sure. I, I, I basically am like, if companies that are focused don't necessarily succeed, but like, if you're unfocused, you're going to die. And especially when you're very early on, um, you have extremely limited resources, time, money, uh, programming, tech resources, et cetera. And especially compared to your large competitors out there that are thousands millions of times more in terms of resources. Um, and so the idea I, I say is start with one feature or product, one category, one market. So Rotten Tomatoes, our feature was the tomato meter. Our category was movies. Our initial market was hardcore moviegoers, right? Because when it first came out, anyone who's looking for more than one review or more than a review beyond the trailer, right? Um, to find out if they want to see a movie, they're probably pretty hardcore. Uh, this is, you know, 20 some years ago. Um, and so when you're really focused, you have a chance of actually building something that works. And then as it grows, you can be, you, you can gradually expand into more features, more categories, more markets, a larger market. Um, but yeah, trying to do too much too early is death. And it almost doesn't matter how many, how much many resources you have, right? You look at even things like um, Quibi, Magic Leap, or Theranos. I mean, these are companies that are raising like billion or billions of dollars and just super unfocused, like trying to do way too many things, not finding something that works and then going with it, um, but trying to do everything at once, right? Uh, and so even in those cases, but usually it's mostly startups who are raising sub million, they're raising, you know, sub 250, sub 100 friends and family money and trying to do too many things with extremely limited resources and they die. And I see it over and over and over again. The ones that are really focused, uh, very bootstrappy, really trying to find something that works. Those are ones um, that tend to win. Um, you brought up Quibi and Theranos and I think Nicola might be another one that you would kind of throw into that category. Um, when we look at these three companies, which are kind of becoming quickly the case studies, uh, it doesn't seem that there was a lot of Silicon Valley investor money in these companies and that it was actually, so like in Nicola's case, um, investments from natural gas and oil companies, in Theranos's case, uh, some healthcare companies and, and investors there, in Quibi's case, kind of the media space. Do you think that, is that something that is worth drawing out as a lesson here is that Silicon Valley investors maybe are a little more savvy because maybe they know what metrics to look at for these companies and that these other, these three companies, Quibi, Theranos, and Nikola were raising capital from non-traditional investors? 
Um, Nicola, I haven't been following as closely, so that one I can't really comment on, but I think in general, yeah, I wouldn't say Silicon Valley investors are like necessarily geniuses or anything, but I think they tend to look for more things before putting more money in. And in these cases, I think all of these companies were ones that raised way too much for where they were. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think that is generally true what you said. Yeah, that right. it's mostly outside money. Yeah, and, and in all three cases, they raised that money before having an initial product launched or any kind of initial, uh, anything launched. Yeah, I mean, with, with um, Quibi, I mean, it was primarily like team, right? It's all around Jeffrey Katzenberg. Mm -hmm. uh, Theranos, I think it was the concept um, that really sold it, the idea that you could, because yeah, I mean, who likes getting blood drawn uh, that much blood and if you could do it with just one drop of blood like of course everyone's gonna be like yeah that'd be better um in their case in particular what i thought would have made a lot more sense um they would have raised less money or or raised it more slowly but they could have been like that's the vision whether or not it's technically possible you know a lot of people say it's not um but it could be like the vision that we would try and go for 10 years 20 years down the road right but I think it's definitely possible with the resources they had that they could have made it 10% faster, 10% cheaper, 10 per, you know, machines 10% smaller and do that every year or two. And after 10 years, maybe, you know, they cut it down like 30, it's 30% of what it used to be, 30% amount of blood needed, 30% the cost, 30% um, the weight of the machines, all that stuff. They could have gotten towards there. Maybe they never get to the, actually to a drop of blood, but they could have done that and they could have done it, like actually done it and, you know, legally and everything like that. But I think they try to go straight for the impossible thing right away. You know, with Quibi, <clears throat> they went and straight made all these shows with all these celebrities and stuff. <clears throat> but I remember thinking when they first started, and I even talked to one of the folks that their company had invested in it was like, when you have this much money, you have a billion dollars, I think at the time, um, this is before they raised more. I was like, why can't you just take a couple million, even, even one million, just run a bunch of tests, right? Find out is 10 minutes the right form length? Cause it, or is it five minutes or is it 15 minutes or is it three minutes or is it a variable time? You know, anything under 10 minutes, you know, between one to 10 minutes, right? And even the format, is it a movie that's been chopped up? Is it, a TV, like the short TV episodes, right? Is it YouTube videos? Is it more like a TikTok video, right? They're, those are very different things. Um, what kind of content is it? Is it horror? Is it comedy? Is it whatever, right? Because they're, they're also very different. Um, and each of those formats lend themselves to different things, right? Like TikTok and those and their competitors, it's very music oriented, right? YouTube is very popular also around music videos, around uh, comedy stuff, right? Um, Twitch is really popular on gaming, right? So you, there's a lot of those kinds of questions that I think they could have spent a million bucks on surveys, on tests, whatever. Like take something, you know, not release it publicly, but like, okay, let's take a movie that's really popular, chop it up into 10 minute chunks or whatever, test. Let's take a Game of Thrones or whatever. Maybe we clip it down so there are shorter episodes, test, right? And then once you're like, okay, we're pretty sure we know what categories it should be in, the length of time, the, um, the, form, the, the style of the, of the shows. Now let's go out, let's make a small slate of, of shows. Let's release it, maybe not in the US big, but maybe release it in Canada or whatever, or release it to a smaller group of people and see, do they engage with this content? Are they retaining, are they coming back, right? And would they pay for it, et cetera? okay, now that looks good. Now let's start going for a bigger launch. And you know, one set of tests, learn some stuff, improve it, then move to the next step, move to the next step. With a billion dollars, they definitely could have done it. You know, they could be like, we got a billion dollars, let's hold back 990 million of it and do, the, do these things. Okay, this works. Now let's go from a million to 10 million. That worked. Let's go to 50. Let's go, let's go to 100. Let's go to 200. Let's go to 500. And had that whole war chest there to be able to do it. Um, versus like, 
let's just do all the things at once. Again, no one can boil the ocean. Like unless somehow Earth got really close to the sun or we got into, I don't know, a huge nuclear war, that's not happening. It doesn't matter. Even now, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they couldn't boil the ocean. But when people try and do all those things right away, it's, it's death. And it, again, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It's still death. Yeah, it sounds like any of these companies would have, been, would have benefited from having you on their advisory board. Uh, maybe they wouldn't be the disasters that uh, they turned out to be. Um, and actually, I wanted to ask you about that. What other companies are you mentoring or advising right now? Um, so typically, uh, mentoring, you know, I'll have tons of, you know, when I speak, usually people reach out and like, I heard your talk. Hey, can we chat? And so I have a lot of folks like that, like one offs, just one time, give some advice on email or, you know, a 30 minute chat or something like that. And that happens a lot. Um, or I help with different programs, you know, I was helping out with Zillow Builders, help out at Berkeley Skydeck, Blue Startups, a couple of these different ones. And I'll regularly, you know, interface with the companies in those programs. Um, so there's a lot of that advising less. Uh, and usually with advising, I like to get to know the person first, you know, meet with them multiple times to make sure I'm comfortable with them. Um, and in that case also, is what they're doing interesting to me? Is there, does there seem to be a fit where I think I can add value? And have they gotten to the point where it makes sense to really actually get on there and start being a formal advisor? Because it's my advice itself, I'm like, that part is like free. But when I become a formal advisor, it's because of connections. They want intros you know, to investors and other folks. And that's something that I, I can't give out as freely. If I'm just, I've met you once and I'm suddenly like making all these intros, I haven't properly vetted you. And if I'm making an intro to an investor where it's, I don't want to waste the investor's time. I want to make sure when I introduce an investor that they're like, oh, well, thanks for bringing that company or that was, that was a really interesting company. So um, yeah, so I'd say most of the companies, a lot of them will come through these programs that I'm, I'm mentoring at. You know, I work with them or I, that's when I first start engaging with them. And it might be over the course of, you know, months or a year or even years um, before I actually, you know, decide to get more formally involved. Uh, so, yeah, so there's some interesting companies. I think one of the most interesting ones came out of Berkeley um, where, where I went to, there was a, a program called Launch, which was like a, a kind of an accelerator program that, and as well as a startup competition. And the year that I, one year where I was helping this company, uh, Oishi, where they were the winners of that year's um, batch. And I wasn't actually their, their direct mentor, but I, I really liked what they're doing. And I was like, oh, this is super cool. And we kept in touch and maybe half a year later, they were actually asking for some intros to investors um, and getting advice. And what they were doing, is, what they are doing is basically doing vertical farming of very high-end Japanese strawberries. And the whole pitch was, it was super interesting, was like 90 some percent of the strawberries grown in the US are grown in California and shipped to the rest of the country. So their idea was do a vertical farm in New York. Well, they're actually in New Jersey, right next to New York, um, of these strawberries that are really super high end. They're really easily bruised, but, the, but because they're in New York, they can sell to New York with very short transport time um, so they can get it instead of, you know, taking like, I don't know, like a week or whatever to get across. The strawberries grown in California have to be very sturdy to survive such a long haul. But theirs, because it's right there, they can make it much sweeter, but they're easily bruised, but they package them very, you know, like individually packaged basically. And, um, and yeah, so it's like, it's very smart. This, they, they made one test farm, everything, you know, it's all completely sold out. And they've grown, I think it's been three years. They ended up raising like 2 million, then 20 million on hundred. And I think they're in the process of raising like 400. Like it's really fast growth. And what's amazing with them is they were super focused. They are still super focused. Um, they've been very efficient with their cash, especially relative to all their competitors in the space who have raised much, much more and accomplished much less. Um, and I didn't even have to force them to be focused. I mean, they actually started focused. And I, I've, 
seen that, like I've realized that, yeah, that combination of someone who's really focused, um, really efficient with cash uh, and has, you know, a big vision. I think that that's just a great combo. Yeah. And so they're one of the ones that I think is um, that I advise that are just super interesting. Yeah. And you mentioned Mozilla. Um, you and I were both just part of their Fix the Internet. Um, I guess you'd call it a campaign or incubator. You as a mentor, a creditor as one of the companies in the batch. Um, I actually wanted to ask you, if you could pick only one aspect of the internet to fix, just one, try to isolate it to like one broken incentive structure or data structure, whatever it is, what's the one aspect of the internet that you would fix if you could Matt, wave that magic wand? I wouldn't say it's a part of the internet that's broken, but I think part of society that's broken that the internet itself could solve is education. Um, because I believe that education is the closest thing we have to a magic bullet that could solve everything, right? Because just imagine if every single person in, on the world, in the world, had a college level education. If every single person was, you know, say as smart as a Bill Gates, the world would be a completely, completely different place. Like we wouldn't be dealing with all these problems of COVID right now, right? Every, every place would be like Taiwan, you know, or something like that, uh, as far as COVID is concerned. Um, all the stuff with racism and sexism and divisiveness and everything I think could be solved by having more understanding, which I think education helps to provide. You know, obviously education helps to provide more opportunities. Um, people can have more opportunities for jobs, earn more, have a higher earning potential um, if they have more education. Again, think of someone, if you were as smart as a Bill Gates, right now like doesn't matter your sex your race anything like what class you came from you're going to get a job somewhere and you're going to make probably pretty good money right and um and the other thing with education i believe is as far as i can tell when i look at my friends and and everyone i know and everyone i can think of i think generally the more education someone has the later they tend to have kids and a lot of times they will have less kids like i'm an example of that um and so education, I believe, will help slow population growth, which will help solve climate and environment issues, energy, uh, food and famine, um, disease, war over natural resources, right? So I believe education can help with all three of those things, um, population, understanding, and earning potential, right? So... And I think the internet is uniquely positioned to solve it, right? Look at um, even now with a calculator, how, how much that helps us with math, right? Um, look at computers, what that can do to, to an average person. Look at what the internet has done with Wikipedia, with YouTube, with stuff like Masterclass, Coursera, right? There, right now, anyone with enough motivation and time could give themselves can learn almost anything you want on the internet you know if with, with if they got pretty good at searching right between all these things out there you can pretty much get a university level education for free on the internet you won't get a degree but yeah my thought would be could you actually really organize that properly you know um where you could actually develop curriculums that are online find the best things out there maybe even redo some of the best things or even get the rights to some of the, the best stuff, put it out there, allow people to go through it. Um, and, and then off, also have degrees and ideally make it free and then not just make it free, uh, get it into every single language out there, you know, and actually actively go and try and get it, get people who really need it to use it. You know, and one example for instance could be like, look at prison, right? Um, when you talk about, uh, was it recidivism? I bet you if people are in jail and they're in there for years, educate them, like have them learn, you know, either make it a requirement and or pay them to do, to learn. And imagine if they came out and they had a college degree. Uh, I bet you the rate of them going back in way, way less, you know, um, where they go in and then normally they come out, they've lost all this time. And now they have a, like a, a record, right? It's going to be really hard for them to get a job. What if 
yeah, they still have a record, but they come out, maybe they even got paid while they're in there to study and they have a college degree. They're probably going to be almost better off than when they went in, you know, um, that's just one example, but I'm, you could take that into like uh, the Midwest or these communities where, you know, people are, their the minds are shutting down, things like that. I bet you, you could go and give them more education. And, and, you know, you hear all the, like, uh, was it the extreme left talking about free education, but their idea is like, let's go and make school free. But I think that model doesn't really work because like where that money come from, but you can make it free through the internet. Like Wikipedia is free. Just make a school version of Wikipedia. Right. And um, yeah. So I think if there's one thing I think could fix it, that's, I think that could fix society. I think that could fix the world. Yeah, it's cliche, but education really is the foundation. Everything else is built on that. Every, and the vulnerability that we see all these people having to automation and job loss, yeah, it would definitely help with that. So let me, let me follow up on that. I fall in the bucket that I think the best teachers in the world so, should be the ones teaching each subject. Since we have the internet, we can all be in a classroom and learn from the best one to three professors on every topic, like learning physics right from Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example. Would you agree that that's the direction we should be going in? Obviously, that will that that might mean that there's a fewer jobs for teachers in the world. But ultimately, if learning is the goal, then learning from the best professors possible is kind of a natural next step. Yeah, I, I mean, like, you look at, like, Masterclass, they're trying to do something like that of, not, you know, non-traditional topics, but they are trying to get some of the best people in the world to, to teach. I think that is definitely um, a, the way to go. I would say, yeah, get the best people in every topic. But I also would, would think about, like Wikipedia, look at the, how much content they cover compared to the old encyclopedias that people used to have on their bookshelves. Um, they cover way more topics and way more in depth than anything you could have possibly ever printed out. Right. And um, so I would actually think also about harnessing, you know, Wikipedia, I don't know what the number is. I want to say it's like, you know, 10,000, 20,000 people are contributing like the majority of what you see on Wikipedia. Could you get a similar thing where you're getting a few thousand professors or just really smart people in every subject doing the same thing? Right. It doesn't have to be the top one to three. I mean, it could be number 1000, but they're still probably really good all contributing to, to a shared curriculum. And I don't think it has to put uh, teachers out of, of jobs. I don't think it, it puts colleges out of business either because community colleges have existed a long time and you can still have these very expensive schools like uh, Harvard and MIT and Stanford, et cetera. Right. Um, because people are paying to go to those still for like the network and the prestige of it. I, I don't think those are going to go away. Right, even if everyone's getting free education, um, it's just going to help, you know, raise the bar for everyone else and help to close the gap a little bit. Um, and same thing with teachers. I think you could still definitely have something, even if it was all all these courses well structured. There's still value in having a teacher who could still have people. People could go to a class with the teacher. You could still watch the videos together. The teacher could help explain material people were having problems with. They could still take attendance. They could still help create the networking that's valuable when you go to a college, right? There's all that kind of stuff that's still useful. They could still help watch the kids. They could still help um, like watch them when they're taking tests, you know? Uh, so I think, but, but at the same time, you know, potentially there's a gap in quality between the worst teachers and the best teachers. And if you could standardize around the best people making like a really strong curriculum, then that quality isn't, you can, you know, again, flatten the difference, the gap. Yeah, flatten the curve, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. I totally agree. I think, I think it's crucial. And I, I think more and more people are coming around to seeing that as kind of the root problem that has yet to be solved. Um, Patrick, you've been gracious with your time. I've got two last questions that I ask every guest that comes on the podcast. But before I get to those two, is there anywhere you want to send listeners to follow your work? Um, sure. I mean, if anyone wants to follow me, I'm on, I, I use Rotten Doubt. Like Rotten from Rotten Tomatoes, Doubt from No Doubt. I used to be a, a really big fan of that band. Um, so I use Rotten Doubt and it's, you know, like uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, 
Instagram, uh, I use the same everywhere. Um, and people can follow me at, at those places. Yeah, everybody send him cold emails now. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, all right, for my last two questions, uh, the first one is Bitcoin. Are you a believer or not so much? I don't really follow a lot of that stuff myself. Um, I have a lot of friends who are very smart who do believe in it, and I trust them. But for me personally, um, I, I haven't seen the thing that I think makes it make sense for an average person yet. Um, and, you know, I guess it still remains to be seen if that will ever happen. Is there a particular thing you're waiting to see it do? Now, obviously, price target is probably not going to be what convinces you. But what do you mean by accessible or usable for the average person? Um, I, I guess I'm talking more about blockchain and crypto but like some application of it that benefits like a normal person and a normal person would use. Like, you know, when, when they had computers, desktop computers, originally people thought it was just going to be for like spreadsheets or something. Right. And, and maybe word processing and everyone uses a computer now and even internet early days, right. It was just for university folks to talk to each other and scientists to talk to each other. And now everyone uses it. And yeah. um, same thing with uh, mobile and phones. Right. Um, I don't know if blockchain is like one of the next big technologies where it will get to the point where it's just embedded everywhere and everyone is using it. Yeah. Um, so usability is really key. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. And my last question for you today, Patrick, is are we living in a simulation? Yes or no? Living in a simulation. Like as far as the matrix and we're all plugged into somewhere? Some version of that, yes. <laughs> I don't know, because I think even if we were, we wouldn't be able to tell. You know, could we be an experiment from some alien race that went around and se seeded a bunch of planets randomly around the universe um, with us and there's basically versions of us everywhere out there? Uh, may maybe. Um, but sometimes with all the craziness this year, I do wonder, right, uh, if there's some higher power that's just kind of screwing with us. Yeah, because yeah. uh, 2020 has been kind of crazy. It has. If, if there's ever been a year to make you feel like you're in a movie, it's this year. Yeah, yeah. They're just like, let's just go into, uh, like, just click the button to, like, screw over the, the character, the players in the, in the game. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, Patrick Lee, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the Creditor Podcast. Again, Patrick Lee is or was one of the co-founders and former CEO of Rotten Tomatoes. I hope listeners go and follow him. And uh, thank you again for everything you've done for us, Patrick. Everything I see you out there doing for other, you know, struggling startups and ambitious entrepreneurs and uh, the whole ecosystem really, I think, owes you a debt of gratitude. So thank you again. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Yep. Thanks again for having me uh, and definitely uh, looking forward to seeing all the, the new updates and everything from Predator. Thanks.